It's the 17th of October, 2015, and this is episode 256. This show is intended for informational and educational purposes only. Cryptocurrency is new, exciting, and empowering, but we're not experts, just obsessed companions walking the road towards a more peer-to-peer -peer future. Welcome to Let's Talk Bitcoin, a twice-weekly show exploring the ideas, people, and projects building the new digital economy and the future of money. My name is Adam B. Levine. I'm the editor-in-chief here at Let's Talk Bitcoin, and today we're focused on the project side of our mantra. I'm pleased to have longtime correspondent Matthew Zipkin back on today's episode as he explores the decentralized, distributed, built-on Bitcoin in 2 of 2 multisig, peer-to-peer BitMarkets project. But first, I caught up with the founder of BitJoy, an innovative BitTorrent client. We talked the problems of torrents and the solutions of Bitcoin. Enjoy the show. On today's episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin, we're joined by Badejo Mender, founder of the Joystream Project. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. So let's start with the basics. What is Joystream and why do we need it? Joystream is a BitTorrent client with the capacity to send and receive micropayments in exchange for bandwidth. So the reason we need this is because BitTorrent is this great peer-to-peer -peer system, but it hasn't really had a compelling way to generate coordination where people don't abuse it and free ride, and everyone sort of contributes to the system, makes it fast for everyone. So the way that people have tried to do this before is that there's a, this tit-for-tat protocol which BitTorrent uses where you'll only get bandwidth from someone if you actually supply bandwidth to them. But that really doesn't work very well. For example, when you're done completing a file, you no longer really care about downloading anymore, and so tit for tat doesn't really give you an incentive to stick around. So in that situation, moving to a payments system is much more effective. So, so what I'm trying to do is basically to solve the incentive problem bit to it. I took a look at your website, and it looks like your software is in a downloadable form. Uh, the, my kind of litmus test with things like this is, if I wanted to upload the LTB podcast and start distributing it through this method for anybody who wanted to collect it through this method, could I use it for that at this point? Are you ready at this point? So right now, that would be premature, you know, for the simple reason, for example, that we're not on Bitcoin mainnet, so you wouldn't really see any of these incentives kick in because, you know, people don't really care about Bitcoin test coins. And also the software is really quite early, so we might have some stability issues, but long term, we definitely could. So I've talked with people about solutions like this before, and there always seems to be, it just seems to be more complicated than, than it is in kind of theory. What are some of the things that while you've been implementing this to this point, like you didn't think were going to be problems, but they've kind of jumped out and this is like a hard problem that you needed to, that you either need to solve or that you needed to solve to get to the point that you're at already? So it depends on what you mean. Technically, there are all sorts of hurdles in trying to combine two sort of peer-to-peer -peer systems to work well together. Um, but I think as to regarding your question about would this work well for content owners to monetize their content, in its present form, I really don't think it would because you know there's nothing preventing anyone from downloading your content and undercutting your price and just start selling it at a lower price but will still recover their opportunity cost of the bandwidth. So since it's a competitive supply of bandwidth, you'd expect that over time the price really just re reflect the cost of bandwidth, which is what you want for a distribution layer, but it's not what you want for monetization layer. So you'd have to add some new layer on top of this to actually give it, make it a compelling product for content owners to distribute content and sort of be the only person making money directly off of the ownership. Yeah, chain of attribution, I guess, is kind of the thing that is necessary there that is missing in what you're doing. But again, again, like I've talked to people who have been focused on that side of it. I've talked to people who've been focused on the more advanced use cases, but you're the first person I've talked to who actually seems to be just focused on this base level use case that is trying to solve this legitimate problem. I mean, I mean, it is a legitimate problem with the BitTorrent uh, system as it stands right now, but you're right, tit for tat doesn't work. And so putting this type of compensation in doesn't seem to solve, you know, all of the problems. It doesn't make uh, BitTorrent into this, you know, wonderful peer to peer everything that it possibly could be, but it seems like it's the first step on that path. Absolutely, yes. It is the first step along the path of making just the distribution infrastructure be perfect, basically. 
And then later, if you're very interested in content, you can add another layer for making sure that people can't very conveniently, at the very least, just copy someone else's content and start seeding it or without, you know, at least send it, sending a cut to the person who's owning it. If I'm looking for something online that doesn't have that many people seeding it, is this, is this type of system designed so that it should incentivize people to want to seed it when I am you know, looking for seeders and willing to pay? Or is it more just trying to uh, make it so that people in general are incentivized to be seeding because they get paid when people take advantage of it? Is it trying to get more seeders or is it trying to keep seeders longer? From the perspective of a seeder, what you want to do is you want exactly to find that rare file which no one else is seeding or very few other people are seeding. Because you are the... As a, as a seeder, you could set your own price. And the few other people who are selling alongside you, so to speak, the higher the price you can charge. So there's sort of this natural incentive effect of trying to find the rare thing that no one else is seeding because you'll be the only guy seeding it. And so you can charge a higher price. And so as soon as somebody, as soon as like I get the thing from you that's really rare that I had to pay you for in order to get the bandwidth, now I also can charge either the same price. And then how would it work if we were charging the same price? Would it just like, can you set your client to connect to the least expensive ones, or is it just select individual peers? That's what it does. So it just picks a subset, which are the uh, cheapest subset that you can find, and it starts paying those. So there's always a pressure to always keep the prices as low as possible. With things that are like, you know, very popular, things that are, you know, like something that's just been released, you know, and it's, it's come out a bunch, of, you know, and everybody has it basically, something like that wouldn't be very valuable at all. But would people still get any kind of compensation? I mean, uh, Bitcoin has a problem, not necessarily a problem, but Bitcoin has a reality about it that every transaction you make costs at least about a penny. And uh, some cases it can be as high as two and a half cents, depending on what type of transaction you're doing. You know, is there like a, you accrue this much and then it pays out? How, how would the system actually work? Am I constantly getting payments as someone is downloading from me? Well, the underlying payment mechanism is a uh, micropayment channel that, you know, you're probably familiar with from streaming. So you do have to pay a setup fee to be able to receive these payments from um, the people who are paying you. So when I'm opening a payment channel, am I opening that between me, uh, you know, as the, the leecher, the person who's downloading, am I opening that between myself and the seeder? Or is it more of like a, you know, basic lightning network type of thing where the network actually is acting as kind of a hub and then individual participants have a channel with the hub and the hub is doing all of the kind of uh, accounting for who actually owes what at that cash out? So right now it's sort of a basic payment channel where if you want to download something, you open one channel with multiple people and then you pay them for that one interaction and then you close the channel. A um, more ideal solution would be sort of a hub solution that you're describing. That way, you don't have to open and close channels every time, but that would be for the future, although that would be profitable. So when I open a channel to download one particular item, you said that it opens it with a group. I haven't seen group payment channels implemented uh, before. How many people or how many recipients can I have in that? So you could have really as many as, as, as you can have outputs in a Bitcoin transaction, really. The traditional payment channel, you have one contract transaction, as it's called, where you have one output for the person that you're going to be paying for the duration of the interaction. But in this version, you sort of take that one step further and you have one output per recipient that you're going to pay. So if you have N people you want to pay, you have N multisig outputs in the contract transaction. So that means you just have one contract you have to pay a fee on to get into the chain, so to speak. BitTorrent is kind of one of those really empowering decentralized technologies that has been really difficult for any company to monetize because its core business model seems to be helping people find things that you know intellectual property would otherwise have them not have access to. It doesn't really seem like the startup that you're doing really pushes that either to the left or to the right, but it does seem like you're giving tools to better monetize what has to this point been unmonetizable because it is largely illegal. Do you have any sort of strategy on that? Is this even something that you guys care about or consider? So I think it's too early for me to consider monetizing this. What I want is to just deploy a large number of these you know, content access gateways with built-in payment capacity. And then in the future, I think it probably is a way to work with you know, people who do own content and find a way for them to distribute and monetize content all over the world in a very accessible way. But I want to start by solving a very tangible problem that a lot of people who use BitTorrent actually have. Take it from there.
So you want to solve the problem, and basically you're saying that at some point you'll have to deal with potential, you know, whether or not it's legal to to do that, or you know whether people are using it for legal purposes. But for now, you're just focused on the capabilities. Right. Okay. So then, do you have any sort of model at this point, or is it literally just you know we're spending money and solving this problem with the idea that we'll monetize the project sometime in the future? It's the latter. Okay. So how's that going? <laughs> well, it's still early days. So I, I launched uh, Alpha about two, seven days ago, and uh, people started using it. It's still a very rough product, but uh, you know, there's a small group of people who find it very interesting. I think this is you know one of the very few consumer-facing applications in Bitcoin that really make a lot of sense, at least to my mind. So uh, a lot of people seem to be excited about uh, giving it a try. Okay, so if people want to try out uh, Joystream, uh, where do they go? What are the requirements? Do they have to download? Is it actually a BitTorrent client unto itself, uh, or is it something that you run separately and then plugs into your existing BitTorrent client? So it's a bare bones BitTorrent client with a built in wallet. You can download it right now on joystream.co, which is the website, and you can start trying it out. There's a pre selected set of forms that are being used for testing uh, with prices that are suggested. And yeah, you can give it a try. So you mentioned that this is uh, still on Bitcoin testnet, which is to say it does not use normal Bitcoin, which is to say if I want to try this, I need to get some testnet coins somewhere. Are you guys providing any sort of faucets or are you just suggesting people go to the normal places? We're linking to block cipher faucet, which is really convenient and really restrict you in terms of getting testnet coins. So, yeah. How long do you think that you're going to be in this uh, sort of, you know, like the, the product is live, but it's not actually useful until it's actually using real value, kind of like you were saying. So uh, how long do you think you're going to be in testnet? Yeah, so it's still definitely going to be a couple of months before I'm confident enough that people could put their real Bitcoins in and they'll be relatively safe from you know, the wallet crashing or the software crashing or someone hacking into it. So it still has a bit of time for it really is ready for prime time. All right. Well, this sounds like a very exciting project. I look forward to being able to put up uh, <laughs> the LTB show on it at some point, even if it's not directly paying us, you know, just to kind of offload the bandwidth costs once that's available. Tell me where you think that this is going to be in, you know, a year, in two years. I mean, like paint the vision. If you succeed, what does the world look like? To succeed, which I really do think it will, I do think it's going to be a product which really lowers barriers to access of content, which I think is a huge problem. Weirdly enough, Spain still does not have access to Netflix, and that's kind of a strange situation. I think this is sort of platform which has a very open payment mechanism, which has a very convenient way of accessing and distributing content, which can finally make content accessible to everyone at a reasonable price, and that's where I'm trying to go. I think that that's a, a noble vision, but I mean, Spain's problem isn't that they don't have the technology to accomplish this. It's that the intellectual property regime makes it prohibitive for whatever reason to accomplish it. So, I mean, I don't see anything in your product that changes that. This is just a different distribution method. But if the problem is fundamentally permission, does that matter? Sure. But I think the fact that you have, for the first time, a payment mechanism, which is very low friction, which is built into this way of consuming content, and the sort of underlying trend of moving exactly in the direction that you're talking about. You know, you move from you know, the record store to Spotify, which was a huge move in the direction of empowering the consumer, really, in a way, at this expense of people who have copyright claims because they had to comply with the underlying change in trend of giving access to consumers. Uh, so I think this is just another step in that direction. And what ultimately changes the content holder's mind isn't that laws are rewritten, it's that actually some things start making more economic sense than others. Today's episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin is brought to you by Tokenly and the SwapBot digital vending machine system. If you currently offer goods or services to online clients or customers, change your relationship from one where you're paid after you've done the work to one where your customers save money by buying your services in bulk and in advance. Representing your products and services as tokens built on Bitcoin is simple and fast. Tokenly tools make selling, using, and accepting them back easy and approachable. New to SwapBot, at no additional cost, are basic bulk discount programs. Now, instead of just picking one price for your token, you can give your customers a good reason to buy as many as they can at one time. They save money and you get paid up front. Interested in some quality San Francisco coffee shipped to your door? Head to letstalkbitcoin.com slash coffee and enjoy discounts when you order freshly roasted coffee in 4, 8, or 16-pound quantities, redeemable and shipped 4 pounds at a time. 
Maybe .com domains are more your thing. Early Let's Talk Bitcoin sponsor EasyDNS.com now offers Domain Plus tokens, redeemable for a new or renewed .com or .net domain. Buy them in quantities from 5 to 50 to get a discount, and pay for your domains one token at a time while enjoying those bulk discount rates. You can visit letstalkbitcoin.com slash EasyDNS to quickly find that bot. Tokens are new, built on Bitcoin, and represent an enormous opportunity to build relationships with your customers, marketers, and resellers buying your tokens in bulk and reselling them at a profit. Create your own SwapBot today at swapbot.tokenly.com, and if you want to talk about how you can take advantage of tokens in your professional life or business, email team at tokenly.com. Today's magic word is joy. That's J-O-Y. Joy. You've got until the 24th of October to visit letstalkbitcoin.com or the Let's Talk Bitcoin iOS app to enter it for your share of the listener rewards. I'm Matthew Zipkin, and today on the show, we're joined by Steve DeCourt. He's the project lead and lead developer for the BitMarkets project. How's it going today, Steve? Great. How are you doing, Matt? Good, thanks. Uh, you posted a video that caught my attention on Reddit uh, about a month and a half ago about BitMarkets. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what the project is and uh, why you think it's important? Yeah, so BitMarkets is a decentralized marketplace. It's kind of unique in that it uses a, a new kind of escrow system that doesn't require a third party. Instead of a two of three multi-sig transaction being set up between the buyer, the seller, and an escrow agent, we use a two of two signature system. Both parties, the buyer and seller, put up deposits equal to the price as well as the payment. And this ensures that everyone's incentives are aligned to complete the transaction as no one can defraud the other without it being unprofitable for them. Cool. And this is, I think, the biggest difference between what you're doing and, say, Open Bazaar, which is you know, another really popular decentralized market project. What do you think is the advantage of doing a two of two escrow as opposed to you know, having a two of three? There are a lot of advantages. The biggest one is that a third party has no way of fairly resolving a dispute. They don't know what product was sent. They don't know what was received unless they're in between that, unless the, the item actually gets sent to them for verification and they're enough of an expert in the category to verify it. All they've got to resolve a dispute is one person's word against another. It's kind of down to who's the best liar, potentially. And that's not a way to fairly resolve a dispute. Right. And in every single dispute, there's going to be you know, one upvote and one downvote for that arbiter. So yeah, when I was talking with the developers behind Syscoin, this, this came up too. They were trying to also do a decentralized market. And it's like, well, what is the point of an arbiter? How could you possibly do that job, especially if you know, we're talking about anonymous markets or possibly contraband or something? It doesn't seem like that's a job that can even be done well. Yeah, I don't see any way to do it unless you actually receive, as the arbitrator, you actually receive the package and can verify it yourself, which I haven't heard anyone propose to doing that, but that would be the only option. Cool. So let's talk about the process of how you actually enter into this sort of smart contract with the, with the party. You know, who puts up the money first and is there any way to get it back? If there's a problem, you know, what's the actual order of transactions? The money is locked uh, synchronously. People use the app to place uh, sales and buyers can see those and uh, respond with a bid. You know, they just hit, hit a buy button the same way they would on eBay. On the seller side, if they accept it, the wallet built into the app starts to construct the multi-signature transaction with their inputs for their side of the deposit. That gets sent across, you know, uh, the back to the buyer and his wallet puts in the inputs for his payment and his deposit that gets submitted to the Bitcoin network. And once it's confirmed, both parties, those funds get locked up effectively. And before that point, neither are locked up. So no one sends the money to the other person first. It's all kind of simultaneously locked when that transaction is on the Bitcoin network. And then once the seller sees that it's there, they know it's safe for them to send the item because the, uh, when the buyer receives it, they're going to have the incentive of not losing their deposit as an incentive to release the transaction, give both people their deposits back and send the payment over. Cool. So this works, you know, the offline transaction process, it just sounds kind of similar to payment channels or Lightning Network, where there's a transaction that's being worked on off the blockchain and then gets submitted once everybody agrees to it and can sign to it. 
Yeah, it could be seen like a lightning channel where there's a single transaction and equal deposits on both sides. So the buyer and the seller agree to a multi-signature address, and then the seller starts by creating a transaction where he would pay into that multi-sig, but they don't send that transaction until... They don't sign it. It's actually a little bit more complicated than I described. One side constructs their input, sends it to the other side. They add their inputs, they sign it, then they send it back to the other side. They sign it and submit it to the Bitcoin network, then it gets confirmed and both sides know that it's locked. So uh, there's some passing back and forth of the inputs and signatures until it's complete. I see. And then so if there's a fraud on one end or the other, then those funds are just locked up, right? Nobody gets their money back. Right. And if uh, for whatever reason, one party doesn't complete their side of the transaction and submit it to the Bitcoin network, the other side can always, you know, until it's that initial escrow is, is uh, lock is confirmed on the network, they can just construct a transaction to send their inputs to uh, another address. But in no case can either party see that their funds are locked when they're actually not. And they can always pull it out until they're, they're actually locked. And then once the buyer receives the item, then he creates a transaction from that multi-sig account back, you know, that refunds the deposit and like that. And then the seller has to sign that and then, then we're done. That's right. Yeah. Okay, cool. And also the, the buyer will put up the payment for the item and the deposit all in that, on that first step, right? Right. The buyer puts up 2x the price and the seller puts up 1x the price. That seems like a pain point to me because if I'm buying something for $100, it means I need to have 200 and I might not get my deposit back for a couple of weeks or, or I could get ripped, you know, if the, if the seller decides not to send me the item, then I lose $200. Uh, well, you can request a refund from the, from the seller, but yeah, if they don't sign that, then, then you would lose the $200. But they have a strong incentive to, to do so. And any seller that made a policy of doing that or any buyer that made a policy of not acting in good faith on their end is going to go bankrupt over time. So there should be a pretty strong guarantee that it, at least in the long term, the market should only be made of players that are acting in good faith. Right. Because in that example, the seller would also lose, say, $100. So, right. Okay. You feel like this type of transaction, like let's, you know, fit markets and open bazaar are out there side by side. Do you feel like there's a certain type of business model that would work better on this system than the two of three? I mean, just, just seems like right away, the first advantage of having an escrow agent is that if something goes wrong, at least you can get your money back. That's just like a possibility that that could happen. There is. There's also the possibility that they could turn it over to the other person. The other person could wrongfully get your money when they didn't, you know, like, let's say the seller's selling you something and you get it and it's an inferior product and you say you're unhappy with it. What does the escrow agent do? Uh, Do they just, do they trust? And the seller says, oh, I sent a perfectly good product. They're going to just end up having a bias in one direction or the other. And then either party, like, Sellers will want to have seller biased agents and buyers will want to have buyer biased agents. And so all of those are problems. But also the problem is in a pseudo anonymous market, it's very easy to construct bots that will do things like make proxy sales so that you, they could see another sale, put up a, another sale, the same sort of item, and then proxy route it to the, the buyer, build up a reputation, and then e- exploit that or set up an escrow agent that signs a bunch of stuff, just fine, builds up a reputation. And then a seller wants to use that escrow agent as their escrow agent. And then they have two of the signatures and can just sign everything over to themselves. So there's a cost to using that escrow agent. And it's not clear that it, that it actually helps. That effect combined with the fact that the buyer has to put up 2x to include the deposit as well. Do you predict that there'll be certain types of transactions that happen in bit markets as opposed to, let's say, Open Bazaar, do you think it's just better overall? Do you think maybe for smaller purchases or maybe for bigger purchases or for more illegal purchases? Or do you think that, that your model will be biased towards one type of market specifically? The places where it would be appropriate are for transactions where both parties would be willing to act punitively in the case that they're defrauded. So like if it's a transaction that's so much money that you can't afford to lose it, you know, or a hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars, depending on what's a lot of money to you, then this situation might, this kind of transaction might not be appropriate, like for, if only for the fact that you might not be able to come up with 2x that amount. And, and the reason why is because you need to be willing to say, I'm going to give up 2x the price of the item to punish the other player, let's say, or, or 1x if you're the seller. 
to punish the other player for bad behavior. If you're not willing to do that, then you've kind of lost the ability to you know, have the incentives for this system to work properly. That's one issue is the amount. But for cash transactions, things that are hundreds of dollars, certainly tens of dollars, maybe up to a few thousand dollars, that should be fine. That should work uh, just fine on the system. Things that you would normally buy with actual cash or that you might you know, take out that much in, from an ATM in cash should be reasonable size transactions for this, this kind of model. I see. And this sounds also kind of similar to, I think it's called CoinFeen, right? The distributed decentralized Bitcoin exchange. I think they also use this type of 202 escrow model. Very similar, like a multi-part sort of lightning transaction between two people with, uh, with deposits. I'm not very familiar with it, though. I haven't looked at it closely. But in theory, bit markets could easily be a, a cash exchange if you were, well, I guess if, if there were some type of, of irreversible bank wire transfer, where you could just like put cash in the mail in an envelope or something like that and use this to buy Bitcoins. Yeah, we actually have a category. People want to put cash in an envelope and send it. They should only do that if it complies with their local laws. But yeah, there are categories for, for people to, to do that if, uh, if they want to, and that should work as well. Cool. And now the other thing that I found interesting about BitMarkets that's definitely different from OpenBazaar is that your OpenBazaar, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, relies on Obelisk servers, which are kind of semi-centralized, or I guess you'd call it uh, distributed, but you are using BitMessage as your communications platform. That's right. So let's actually take a second, kind of talk about how BitMessage works. It's not a blockchain or an altcoin, right? It's, it, but it's also sort of like a network flooding message distribution system. That's right. The bit message nodes sort of uh, connect among themselves, just like the Bitcoin network does. And, you know, on the Bitcoin network, you have the mempool of transactions that haven't made it into the chain yet. And all the nodes just share those transactions as long as they look valid. Bit message sort of does that with any message that you send to the network. And to prevent too much spam, you're required to do a proof of work for each message. So you, it's kind of like hash cash. So your machine has to work for a few minutes. And then it can submit it to the network. And each server that receives that message verifies uh, that it has this proof of work stamp on it. And the network caches these messages for, it was two and a half days. I don't, I'm not sure if they've changed that recently, though. But about several days. And that's long enough to have all the messages propagate through the network. And as long as you check the network within that amount of time, you can receive your message. And Typically, you send in an acknowledge response. And so if the other side doesn't see that, then they can guess that, oh, maybe you weren't on the network, and they could resend the message with another proof of work stamp on it. And so you can do email-like messaging. Well, and the, the proof of work takes like four minutes or something is like the current difficulty, right? Yeah. I mean, d- it depends on how large the message is. If you had like a message with a big image in it, it could take, you know, 20 or 30 minutes, but a small message with a small image, yeah, several minutes maybe. Okay, and the bit message nodes, there's no type of subsidy or mining reward or anything. It's, it's kind of like Tor. It's just like volunteers, people who want to participate that are sort of for the good of the community posting a node. Right. I should add that uh, it's a little bit different than uh, like an email network where you can actually see who a message is from and who it's to. It preserves privacy much better. The entire message is encrypted. So only the receiver can, can decrypt it. And on the front of the message is just a small hash of the receiver's address, which would map to you know, potentially millions of potential receivers. So somebody monitoring the network, uh, at least the stuff flowing between nodes, wouldn't, by looking at the messages, know who's sending what to whom. And the way that receivers actually receive it is they ask for messages that match their addresses' hashes. Then they try to decrypt each of them and you know, only a few of those will actually be for them. But if they can decrypt it, they know it's for them. Pretty strong privacy protection there. But you do need to be careful about how you put messages on the network because somebody observing the whole network could potentially see, like someone who, who you're sending a message to, if they're also observing the network, you want to submit messages to the network in a way that it isn't clear where the initial address that it came from was, which is why we couple a bit message with Tor. So for a system like BitMarkets, not all the messages are one-to-one. For example, if I just want to announce to the entire world that I'm trying to sell my car, can you post an unencrypted message or how does that work? There's a standard for how public channel names are used as the entropy for uh, BitMessage addresses. So anyone who knows the name of a channel uh, and shares that, the other people can 
construct the, the key pairs basically for those addresses. So that's how public addresses work. They're places that everybody can read and write to. Of course, you can, you can sign your messages being specifically uh, from yourself. So you can verify who's the, who the message was sent from, even if it's to a public channel. Okay, cool. So each BitMarkets node watches a certain bit message channel for new for sale posts. Uh, that's right. There's a BitMarkets, I think right now it's called like BitMarkets beta channel or something that we're using. And the, the clients look at that. Okay, cool. And then once you find a seller, you just send them private one-to-one messages over BitMessage. That's right. But there's no direct like human-to-human communications where you just type a message to someone. It's all uh, automated and push buttons. So you, you just click buy or you click, you know, I accept this bid or you, you know, ask for a refund, make payment. The only place where anyone types anything is, is the description of the item for the poster and the address, the delivery address from the, the uh, buyer. You can't even ask a question to the seller about their item? That's right. Yeah, we did that intentionally to prevent any sort of negotiating of the escrow once it's set up. Because you could find someone that says, look, I'm never going to send you, I'm never going to release this, so you might as well release it over now to me so you don't lose the whole thing or you know, something like that. Part of the idea for this kind of escrow system came out of a classic psychology experiment called the ultimatum game. Uh, are you familiar with that? Uh, no. Why don't you tell us about it? It's, uh, you've probably heard about it. It's when they set two people that don't know each other down at a table and they say, you can't talk, but we're going to put a big stack of money in front of one of you, maybe up to like a month's salary. And you get to decide how to divide this between you and the other person here. And then if they agree with how you divide it, and they only get to give a yes or no answer after you finish dividing it, then you both get to keep the money. But if they don't agree, then neither of you get the money. And what they found is that people will, unless it's almost an even split, will reject the money, even though, you know, for all they know, the person who's dividing it is someone placed by the experimenters there, and they're just turning down free money. They will punitively act because they have a sense of fairness. As long as they do that in our system, as long as they uh, are willing to give up essentially some money to punish uh, a bad actor, then that will keep everybody honest. And the ultimatum experiments suggest that that people are willing to do this, which just standard game theory wouldn't predict. They have no reason to believe this is a repeated game and that they're part of a larger process. This could be a one-off or very few-off thing, in which case they'd be just turning down free money. But we're kind of built to think in the long term. So one of the conditions is that the two parties can't talk to each other at all because that might influence fairness. Right. Then they could start negotiating. And that is a much more complicated situation. If you don't give you know, one party the opportunity to say, look, you might as well release this because I'm not going to do it, then you seem to be in a much better place for people being willing to act punitively because they never have the chance to like, know what the other person's thinking or that they might have some in-between options or that sort of thing. Right. So you've sort of disabled a communication channel for a type of consumer protection, it seems, but your project's open source. Anybody could just add a patch where you can see the public address of the seller and, and send them a message, theoretically, right? I mean, we could go around this, this blockade. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a really easy feature to add, and all the code is, is actually, you know, it wouldn't be very much work to add that. But yeah, we decided to make that difficult to access for what we feel is a good reason. The seller just sort of has to make sure that their the listing is the only message that they really post, and it has to be descriptive enough. If they if they're trying to sell a shirt and they don't write the size, people can't ask what size it is. Just nobody's going to buy it. The seller eventually is going to have to realize that his listing wasn't good and update. That's right. Okay, and it gives people a strong incentive to be very specific about what they're selling. Like if it's of a particular quality level. You know, they should know that they should be very honest about that. Instead of kind of being a bit optimistic about it, they should be very frank because if they do anything to make the other person feel like uh, they weren't acting in good faith, they may find themselves losing a lot of money in the transaction. Well, I'm, well, I'm, well, I'm the Bitcoin trader, navigator of the Bitcoin sea. I'm a real motivator when it comes to making money for me. And I might go short or long, but I like to tell everybody.
buddy that I've never been wrong. I'm the Bitcoin trader. Come on and hear me sing my song. Well, I made about a quarter million dollars on the old Mount Cox. And I jumped that ship about a year before it hit the rocks. I put a little into LTC. Then I doubled and I bought a place in Waikiki. I'm the Bitcoin trader. Come on and take a look at me. the moon like a bat out of hell. I'm the Bitcoin trader, ka hear me ring my bell. More speed ahead, Captain. Ride them a Bitcoin waves, boys, ride them high and low. I said I ride them a Bitcoin waves, heave ho, heave ho. I don't give a damn about no whales. Those moby dicks are gonna burn in hell, so ride them Bitcoin waves away, heave ho. Almighty that I don't get hacked. Pray to God Almighty that I don't get hacked. Pray to God Almighty that I don't get hacked today. Pray to Mighty God Almighty that I don't get hacked today. I like this model. It's it seems like you're reducing the amount of like human trust, which is kind of something that all these decentralized projects are trying to do. So it it makes a lot of sense to me. But then how do you address reputation? For example, if there's two sellers that appear to be selling the same thing, how do I choose? Right now we don't have any reputation system at all. And the idea is basically we want to see if this works well before we start adding layers of complexity to it. And also that so far, it doesn't seem to us that anyone's come up with a reputation system that actually works in a pseudo anonymous way. It's too easy to create fake reputation or to buy reputation. I suspect what's going to happen is the systems that are using reputation and two of three escrow are going to have a series of exit scams of exploitation of these reputation systems that uh, people aren't really seen as potential problems, but will be and, and have been. I mean, there have been a bunch of dark market exit scams systems based on two or three escrow or reputation that people have lost a lot of money with. I suspect that's going to keep happening until people realize that reputation, pseudo anonymous reputation doesn't work the same as real world reputation. No one has a door to knock on if you know you don't receive what you pay for, you don't get paid like they do in the real world. And the rules are just very different. Is there any way to see any other information about the seller, like what his other items are maybe, or what any of his past transactions were? Well, right now we don't change the, uh, the bit message address that the seller uh, uses between posts. So you could potentially, uh, if you, you know, and we do display the address. So if you get an item that you're happy with from one address and you see that address post again, then you know it's the same person or same entity and you could order again from them. We would like to add like some favorites features uh, as well as a feature for a seller to potentially use a different address every time if they want it to be more anonymous. But yeah, we want to add some features for if people wanted to use the same address, it would be easy for buyers to repeatedly buy from them with like a favorites feature. Right. Would it make any sense to, say, expose on the blockchain which transactions the seller had already engaged in to sort of prove that, I don't know, that they can do a transaction fairly? Well, right now we don't expose any of that information and it would be, might be a little bit tricky to do that. I mean, it, did, it just doesn't seem worth it because it's so easy for someone just to create multiple identities and buy from themselves to build reputation, right? It's just so easily gameable that it's kind of worthless. And I haven't heard any proposals for a way to prevent people from easily creating reputation. 
So I guess in, until we see a, a way to actually protect against the really ex- easy exploits of reputation system, it doesn't seem worth adding. Are you considering a reputation? Like, is there anything in the back of your mind about how it might be able to be accomplished? It, I mean, it obviously is a really hard problem. There are situations where you do definitely need reputation. Um, like, let's say you're going to have a ride sharing service that worked this way. You don't want to get in a car with someone <laughs> that, that you don't know their reputation, if only because they could use, they could coerce you physically to sign the transaction over or worse. So in systems like that, where you're directly and physically interacting with the other party that is providing a service or a product, yeah, you need, you're going to need some reputation system. But again, you, you're losing anonymity at that point. Like you're going to see the person face to face and uh, neither of you is really going to be quite anonymous anymore. So that's a very different sort of transaction. But yeah, I would like to see those sorts of services be able to eliminate all the middlemen in the same way that we're doing for these more eBay-like transactions. And I think trust networks or web of trust systems might be appropriate there. It's a pretty big problem to tackle and we didn't want to take it on first thing. Really what you're exposing is, is how little reputation and trust there actually is out there already. And sort of services that try to offer a reputation system, you, know, you look at BitMarket, you're like, well, what is that reputation actually doing for me? Uh, not much. It would be so easy to construct a fake reputation that uh, a real reputation wouldn't be worth a lot. How far along are you in the project? There's a beta release that's available on Mac and, and you've got some other operating systems coming out soon. Has anybody, you know, have you made any transactions with anybody yet? Where are you guys at? So we released last November. You know, we're just developers, so we didn't, we didn't really think a lot about marketing it or, or telling people about it. We figured people would find it, and as long as it worked well, it would do fine. It would, you know, create a, a market, an active marketplace. But uh, after a couple of months, no one was really using it, you know, other than a few posts here and there. So we decided to, you know, start giving talks about it and uh, made a, a video about it. You know, I've been doing podcasts uh, like this one. People seem to, it, it's been really well received. Uh, as far as I know, we haven't gotten very many posts yet. People are still trying to figure out what's going to be a good solution, what's worth using. One of the problems is, like you mentioned, it's only for the Mac right now, but we're working on uh, Linux and, and Windows ports. So hopefully when we get those out, we'll have a better chance of more people using the service. Right. And maybe when another couple of darknet markets implode or you know, some of the two or three systems get scammed, like you said, then, then the demand for a two of two escrow will jump. Yeah, I think that's unfortunately inevitable that people are going to keep using those systems and, and there's going to be a lot more exploits, you know, until they start using safer two of two systems. So besides spreading out to other platforms, are there any other features you see in the long term to add to BitMarkets? There's lots of stuff that we'd like to add. Maybe the biggest would be moving to some sort of uh, messaging system that could be a lot faster. We used BitMessage because it seemed pretty good and it actually worked, had a working you know, demo client and uh, there were lots of nodes around already. And it seemed like it had spam resistance, which a lot of the other proposed distributed hash table systems didn't seem to have. Uh, so it was just like a matter of time before you know, they got taken down. BitMessage seemed pretty solid, but it doesn't really scale. Uh, and it scales enough for a Craigslist or eBay, but not for larger markets. And it's not very fast. So if we're going to do things like ride sharing services or things like that, we'll need a better messaging network. So that, that's probably the biggest piece we like to do. And that it would make sense to work on things like a reputation system. And, and then lots of small features like uh, favorites and uh, some more security features, things like that. And are you looking for more developers right now? What's your code base in? Uh, it's all in Objective-C. Uh, we're in the process of porting it to Linux and Windows using a framework called GNU Step. That's sort of a open source re-implementation of the Cocoa and other Objective-C frameworks on OS X that's cross-platform. Yeah, if anybody is familiar with Objective-C and would like to help out, that would be great. We've also been kind of considering look, 